Today's episode is sponsored by Magellan TV. It's just two days before Christmas in 1985, and a thick cloud of fog rolls down over the Californian city of Concord in Contra Costa County. Through the mist and darkness, two flashing red lights are seen in the sky. A plane appears, descending towards the Buchanan Fields Airport runway on the city's western outskirts. Weather conditions are far from ideal for flying, but behind the controls of the twin-engine Beechcraft 95A55 Baron aircraft is an experienced pilot. World War II veteran James Graham has flown in the Navy and has spent almost half a century inside the cockpit. The thick fog, however, makes landing difficult, even for an experienced pilot. In the first attempt to land, he misses the approach and flies by the control tower. These situations are more likely to happen when visibility is low, as it is today. Graham ascends his aircraft for another approach and disappears into the clouds. Suddenly, the plane reappears in a steep, descending right turn. It comes down straight toward the nearby mall like a kamikaze plane. A loud explosion shakes the neighborhood, followed by a ball of fire rising 40 feet into the air. The plane crashes into the skylight of the Sun Valley Mall and creates havoc inside. Christmas now turns into a tragedy. A festive atmosphere buzzes inside the Sun Valley Mall just moments before. Christmas is just two days away, and the mall is crowded with last-minute holiday shoppers and kids who have come to see Santa. It's half past eight in the evening, and thousands of people are inside. Blissful and merry, they are unaware that tragedy is looming over them. At 8.35 p.m., out of nowhere, a thundering crash shakes the mall. A plane hits the skylight near the Macy's department store, tearing a 50-foot-long hole in a devastating explosion. The skylight bursts into thousands of pieces of glass and metal that rain on the people inside. The plane wreckage sweeps across the mall's atrium, down to the bottom floor, while the flaming droplets of plane fuel set ablaze the entire place. Upon crashing down, the aircraft breaks the pipes of the fire sprinkler system and disables it. Water gushes out of the pipes, but does not affect the spreading blaze. Then, the power goes out. In a matter of seconds, the festive atmosphere turns into chaos. People are running everywhere, caught by panic and the shower of burning fuel and debris. Many scream in agony, with burned skin hanging off their bodies. plane came through the ceiling and blew up into my face, and I fell back onto the ground and my boyfriend dragged me in through Macy's until I stood up. Kim Aguirre and her three-year-old son Molina were in line to see Santa when the plane hit the mall. Fragments of the skylight fell on her as she tried to protect him. She felt her body burning as she grabbed her son, wrapped him in her coat, and ran towards the exit. Somehow she managed to find a side door that led them to safety. It was sheer luck that the two of them survived. Next to her in line was another mom, An On and her 14-month-old son, Alexander, who were both burned by roof debris. On survived the crash, but her son didn't. Unfortunately, he was not the only one who lost his life that day. Victims were everywhere. Before the ambulance arrived, other shoppers and store employees acted as first responders. Using clothes from the stores, they made improvised stretchers to carry the victims and put them inside the decorative central fountain to ease their pain. Sears employees used all the ice from the refrigerators to help. The Christmas-themed area went into a ball of flame almost instantly upon the impact. Yeah, there was nothing left of the area where Santa was. The tree and all just totally burnt up, just went up in a ball of flame, and there were little kids running out of there, and some of them, their clothes was burning and stuff. The help was quick to come, though. When they arrived, neither the firefighters nor the medics knew what happened since the sprinkler system initiated the alarm. Shoppers who witnessed the tragedy provided them with misinformation, claiming a terrorist attack or earthquake happened. Regardless, what was clear was the disaster's massive scale. Almost every ambulance in the county was called to the scene. The injuries ranged from cuts and bruises to smoke inhalation and severe burns. The injured were transferred to 10 different hospitals, with the critically injured taken to the Alta Bates Burn Center in Berkeley. 
The final toll was 77 injured and seven people dead. James Graham, the pilot of the plane that crashed, and two passengers died on the spot. The day after the crash, 22-year-old Pam Stanford, who came to the mall to pick up a wedding ring, died of her injuries. She had suffered burns to over 80% of her body and was on life support. In the weeks that followed, three other shoppers succumbed to their wounds, of whom the youngest was the 14-month-old Alexander Owen. Survivors went through a difficult recovery period that for some victims included dozens of operations. In addition to having their faces and bodies disfigured, they also suffered psychological trauma as a result of the disaster. It was a horrendous tragedy that no one could explain. On December 24th, Federal Aviation Administration and National Transportation Safety Board investigators arrived at the scene to determine the cause of the accident. Parts of the plane were removed and taken for examination, while the two engines were sent to the manufacturer's facilities for inspection. A legal action taken by the widow of the pilot delayed the investigation at first. When examining the engines for potential failures, the manufacturer had denied her technical representative's participation in the inspection. While the dispute was ongoing, investigators from the NTSB and the manufacturer Teledyne Industries were banned from tearing down the engines. The district court later rejected the widow's demands and allowed the inspection of the engines to continue. The investigation ultimately found no mechanical problems with the plane and ruled that the accident was caused by the pilot's error and spatial disorientation. If Graham's error was due to disorientation, the fog that covered the Buchanan Field Airport that night was undoubtedly behind it. In such conditions, a pilot could quickly become unaware of his position relative to the ground. However, James Graham was a skilled pilot with experience in tricky weather conditions. According to his colleagues, he was composed and not prone to taking risks or making costly mistakes like this. So, what happened that caused the experienced pilot to crash his plane straight into a crowded mall? On the night of the accident, December 23rd, he attempted to land by instruments only because the low visibility made a standard landing procedure impossible. On approaching Concord, Graham received a clearance approach from the Oakland Air Route Traffic Control Center and Travis Air Force Base Approach Control. The local Buchanan control was not equipped with radar and could only provide a landing clearance. At 8.33 p.m., Graham was cleared to execute a straight-in landing at runway 19 Romeo, one of the two runways at Buchanan, the other being 1 Lima. A straight-in landing is executed using instruments until the pilot can see the runway, so they are supposed to descend the aircraft to an altitude of 340 feet above mean sea level or 320 feet above the ground and fly at that altitude until they can see the runway guides. However, if they reach a runway threshold, the so-called missed approach point, and overlook the runway, they must ascend their aircraft and execute the missed approach procedure. This means the pilot will abort the landing and go around. It was exactly what happened that night. At 8.35, Graham missed the approach and informed the tower he was going to make another attempt to land. The tower controller instructed him to contact the control at Travis Air Force Base. According to the NTSB report, only a garbled reply was heard and there was no further radio contact with the aircraft. In a standard re-approach procedure, the pilot retracted the landing gear on his Baron aircraft and executed a climbing left turn to 2,500 feet above mean sea level. The plane entered clouds and shortly thereafter reappeared in a steep descending right turn, after which it crashed into the mall. Why exactly Graham made the sharp turn that caused the devastating tragedy remains unknown. There was a suspicion that Graham tried to execute an illegal approach to runway 1 Lima after he missed runway 19 Romeo, in which case he had to make a right turn but the controller was recorded giving Graham the instructions to contact Travis Control per the missed approach procedure. Also, if Graham wanted to make an illegal approach to runway 1 Lima, he wouldn't have retracted his landing gear. Controllers at the Buchanan Tower had earlier been accused of instructing the pilots to execute such an illegal circle-to-land landing. Instead of executing missed approach procedures, which initially backed up the suspicions, 
the NTSB report concluded pilot error, disorientation, and adverse weather conditions as the probable causes of the tragedy. The Sun Valley Mall crash infuriated the public. In the past, there had been calls for the airport to be shut down as it was out of place in their community. When the Buchanan Field Airport was built in 1943, it was surrounded by marshes, fields, and walnut groves. Forty-two years later, the area was filled with housing developments and shopping centers. By 1985, it was developing into a corporate hub with high-rise office buildings erected in the streets that bordered the airport and along the flight path. Fear that similar or even worse accidents might happen was increased by the proposal to introduce the Pacific Southwest Airlines flights, with large commercial airliners coming from Los Angeles International Airport. In the winter months, fog lingers for weeks in Concord and limits the visibility to zero, in which case pilots must fly low using instruments only to land. In Buchanan Field Airport's surroundings, this was a dangerous venture. Many residents believe that the Concord City Planner's negligence meant the Sun Valley Mall crash was an accident waiting to happen. Especially since a year and a half earlier, another small plane crashed into a car store storage shed on the same street as Sun Valley Mall. Six people were killed. Nevertheless, despite the residents' concern, the airport remained in function but only for non-commercial service. The city's development continued according to previous plans, with more high-rise buildings being built near the airport. GPS and infrared vision have made airplanes flying in and out of Buchanan much safer than they were in 1985. The Sun Valley Mall reopened after renovations, with stores that were not affected operating the next day. In the end, City officials were found responsible for the accident, and multiple lawsuits filed by the survivors, the families of the deceased, and owners of destroyed shops were aimed at them. According to complaints, the shopping mall should not have been built so close to the airport. Over 100 claimants were compensated with $11.5 million after many years of trials. This would be the equivalent of about $31 million today. If you want to see more disaster documentaries, I recommend watching Alive on Magellan TV. This well-researched documentary series tells disasters from the perspective of survivors who had the smarts and the raw human instinct to survive. In the Station Nightclub Fire episode, four survivors share their stories of this horrific inferno and stampede of people scrambling to escape before the nightclub collapses and kills them all. Magellan TV is the documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers. When you sign up, you can choose from over 3,500 hours worth of full-length documentaries, and 15 to 20 new episodes are added every week. As a result, Magellan TV has the most varied history content available anywhere, covering ancient to modern history, science, space, and more. You can watch on your TV, laptop, or mobile device for as low as $4.99 per month. Magellan TV is offering Dark History viewers the first month of streaming for free to watch a live and the rest of their extensive collection of history content. Click the link in the description to start your free month of documentaries today. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.